Hello and welcome everyone. I'm Tom Boley, Chief Market Strategist at EarningsBeats.com, and this is Trading Places Live. It's Tuesday, November 22nd, 2022, and I'm pre-recording this Trading Places Live for just a little bit later this morning. Currently, we are showing futures up just slightly, uh, Dow futures up about 70, S&P 500 futures up 7, NASDAQ futures up about 11, uh, so a little bit more strength on the Dow and the S&P um, in the uh, futures action over the NASDAQ. And we've seen that a little bit really over the past uh, few weeks, we've seen a little bit more strength in the Dow and the S&P 500 with the exception of those two days, Thursday and Friday after the October CPI report came out. Um, currently we've got crude oil futures up a little bit more than the dollar. So back just over $81 a barrel, 10 year treasury yield currently down two basis points, 3.80%. Um, and that's how we're going to get started. We don't have a whole lot of economic news out this week, not a whole lot of uh, earnings news. The economic news that we do have out um, will be out on Wednesday. We'll go over that in just a minute. Let me walk you through today's agenda first. We will start off with, of course, the daily market recap, then uh, talking technically sentiment update. Just want to go briefly over that long-term moving average of the CPCE. Had a few questions about that, uh, so I'll go back over that. Then the scooter report, earnings spotlight, and three you must see. For those new to Earnings Beats, let me walk you over to earningsbeats.com first. A couple of things going on. I want to make sure everybody's aware we do have our fall special going on right now. This is the best deal of the year to join, become an Earnings Beats member. Uh, we do... Uh, uh, have plans set up where the longer you want to become a member, the longer the free time will give you. So the longer you extend for the more free time, you can get up to one year free by extending or by um, uh, becoming a member and going out three years, you get one year for free. So uh, anyhow, if you have more questions, you can click on that, get more information. All right, let's move on. Let's uh, take a look at what happened on Monday. This is a holiday shortened week, of course. Thursday is uh, Thanksgiving Day celebrated here in the U.S. Friday will be an abbreviated day. The market uh, remains open, <clears throat> excuse me, till about uh, 1 p.m. Eastern. So it closes three hours early. Thursday closed entirely. Uh, usually volume is very light this week. And as we get closer to Thursday, you'll see more and more folks traveling and so volume tends to go down considerably barring some kind of major news uh, normally we would see much lighter volume this week uh, yesterday we had the dow jones industrial average down 45 s p was down 15 nasdaq down 121 and on a percentage basis you can see the nasdaq was hit harder we are getting closer to a key 20-day test on the nasdaq after we had that big thursday and friday following the October CPI report, uh, that was about 10 days ago. We broke out above the 20, we broke above the 50, and we just recently saw the 20-day moving average cross the 50-day. That's a golden cross. Um, and now we've pulled back. So we're at 11,024. The 20-day is at 10,966, and the 50-day is 10,931. So we're not far. I mean, we're only about a half of 1% away from testing that 20 day moving average. And for me, if you believe that this is an uptrend um, or you're just simply playing the price action, which suggests it's an uptrend, at least for now, the best time, in my opinion, once you've broken through these moving averages and you go back and test them, that's the best time if you want to take a shot with leveraged ETFs because you can keep your stop very tight. If you end up going back down below the moving averages, I would not, I mean, once you're back below the key moving averages, I don't believe that's a very good time to be in a leveraged ETF on the long side. So I would be out of that leveraged ETF. But as you pull back and you test these key areas, because you want to catch a leveraged ETF when it reverses, when it's uptrending. Leveraged ETFs like the QLD, which is designed to track the NASDAQ 100 at a two to one clip, if you actually catch an uptrend because of the compounding effect, you can actually make more than 2%. But the same holds true to the downside. You don't want to be in holding a leveraged ETF when you have a breakdown on the major indices or if you're trending lower. So here, 
at these moving averages, what I'm suggesting is that you would be looking for a reversal at the moving average. That's what I would expect in an uptrend. If it doesn't, then it starts to paint more of a picture of consolidation. And when you're going nowhere, that's where erosion plays a much, much bigger role in those leveraged ETFs. So just anyway, be careful, but this is a point on this pullback where you might consider something like that. Mid caps um, down six points yesterday. That's about a quarter of 1%. Small caps down four, about a third of 1%. All the major indices, again, remain above their key moving averages. We've seen golden crosses on all the major indices. So the 20 is now above the 50. Price action's above the 20. PPOs are positive. Everything is designed, set up for a move to the upside until it changes. Staples, discretionary. Uh, this was quite a, uh, a move in opposite directions yesterday. We've had staples, which have been doing extremely well uh, over the course of the last three, four, five weeks. You can see it on the chart. Discretionary, not so much, just going sideways. So the relative strength has been favoring staples, which is not a great signal. Um, it's only one signal, but it's a pretty important one to me. Um, and that one is not favoring the bulls right now. We would need to see that discretionary group break out. We do have a potential bottoming head and shoulder pattern. And I say potential because you don't know until you get the breakout. But on this move down, you can see left shoulder, neckline, slightly lower move, puts in the head. Back to the 50-day um, moving average, puts in the right side of the neckline. We're now in the potential reverse right shoulder. A breakout above about 147, 148 is what I would be looking for there. Energy continues to drift lower. We did rally back off the earlier low, but it's just showing signs of weakness. Um, that uh, negative divergence in play suggested a possible 50-day test. Uh, we went down, got to 87 from 95 and change. So we got pretty close, but we still have a few more dollars to go to get down to that 50-day. Technology and communication services both weak yesterday. So the weakness was pretty uh, consistent among the aggressive areas of the market, although financials and industrials have been hanging in pretty nicely. Um, but the three key cornerstones of what I would suggest is the, you know, a secular bull market environment. If you look at the three key sectors, usually it's discretionary technology and communication services. And while they've improved, they certainly are not leading the market to the upside. So we'd like to see some of that. Uh, fourth quarter tends to be so-so for these areas. December picks up a little bit, and January is where we really start to see, um, historically anyway, a lot more relative strength in those areas. Ten-year Treasury yield, um, as I mentioned, it is down um, just a couple of, of uh, basis points this morning. Um, looking at the 10-year Treasury yield, we are still trending now below the 20. The 20 keeps dropping, the 50 is rising. Looks like we're about to get the death cross, not quite there yet. I would be watching. I've mentioned this quite a bit on the show yesterday over at Earnings Beat, so I'm not going to talk about it a whole lot. But the breakdown occurred at about 391, and the 20-day moving average is at 391. So any move back to the upside, as long as it stays below 391, I think still remains in the confines of this downtrend. Anything above 391, and it starts to look a little bit more like sideways consolidation, some other kind of maybe it's a continuation pattern of what we've been seeing with higher rates. I don't want to just ignore the possibility that rates could go higher. And if they do, that would be definitely a negative for not only the market, but especially uh, the high growth area of the market. So at least keep that in mind. I mean, we've got potentially what could be a left shoulder. This could be a rally to the neckline. This could be the head. If we break back out, we get back to four and a quarter, we could be looking at the right side of a neckline, and then a pullback to the moving averages would establish the um, right shoulder in an inverse, a uh, bullish inverse um, head and shoulders pattern. So this is more of a continuation pattern, or we could maybe just see it go back up to the highs and have like a little cup. That's the possibilities to the upside. But to the downside, until we get through 391, Pay attention to that moving average and pay attention to the fact that the TNX now shows a PPO in negative territory. So we do have bearish momentum in the 10-year Treasury yield. And if we fail 
at the moving averages and go back down and set new lows, that would bode very well for the NASDAQ and for those growth areas. So the 10-year Treasury yield is going to be a big part of this, going to be a key component to watch. Um, and I think 391, maybe even 392, I think this other low is at 392. Right in that range, that's going to be your key yield resistance to watch. All right, let's move on to uh, talking technically. I did uh, want to just mention that tomorrow the economic news uh, calendar gets busier because the uh, market is closed on Thursday, so we have initial jobless claims on Wednesday instead. We've got durable goods, new home sales, consumer sentiment, and then in the afternoon, the FOMC minutes. So all of the economic news that we have is basically all piled in uh, to Wednesday morning. And then uh, this afternoon, we're going to get a little talk from Loretta Mester. She's the current president and CEO of the Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland. Um, so she is part of that uh, Federal um, Reserve Committee that decides rates. So, of course, everyone will be listening. She speaks at 11 a.m. Eastern today. Um, so if the, something happens in the market around 11 o'clock or a little after 11, it could be something that that she said, although she spoke yesterday and she just basically said, you know, that it looks like they're going to be slowing rates. I'm paraphrasing here. It looks like they're going to be slowing the, the pace of the rate hikes, but that they need to see more um, positive news on the inflation front um, before considering, you know, reducing or eliminating those rate hikes altogether. Um, so looking at the S&P 500, again, what I was just talking about with the yield moving down and looking at that 20 day moving average as yield resistance. Well, this is the flip side. It's the other way. With the yield coming down, we've seen equities rallying. And so now we've got this big uh, gap up on the S&P, which is at 3860, roughly. So there's um, some gap support. We got the 20-day moving average at 3880. And then, of course, 3900 has just been the key area. That's been an area where the market has pivoted many times in the past four to six months. So 3,900, we've got to keep on our radar. Um, so 3,900, 3,880 is your 20-day, and 3,860 is your gap support. So all of that to the downside, watch that. If that goes, then we could be looking at more consolidation, more sideways action like we've been seeing really uh, since back in June. If we can make the breakout, though, but without losing the support area, if we make this breakout back up above, I think it's 4,006, um, yeah, 4,641 was the open there. That would suggest more upside ahead. That would be what we would be expecting in an uptrend, staying above the 20, which is above the 50, the PPO strong, and price action breaking out again. NASDAQ 100, very similar, although maybe not as strong on a relative basis, but chart pattern very similar. Um, we do have the 20 now, which is crossed above the 50. So the 20 is at 11,437. The 50 days, 11,360. And your gap support here is 11,350. So that is a lot of support in this area between 11,500, or excuse me, 11,350 and 11,437. That's where all your support and again, the closer you are down to these this support level, the better it is in terms of something like the QLD, which is the leverage DTF that I spoke about earlier. Or if you really wanted to get crazy, the TQQQ. That's the triple QQQ, which is triple the NASDAQ 100. Just keep in mind, yes, you can earn three times the return. So if the NASDAQ turns higher, you can make three times that amount. Understand, though, the risk is that you can lose three times on the way down. So if you put your whole account in to a leveraged ETF, you're not just investing your account. It's as if you're in margin to the tune of, you know, triple your account size. So please be careful with these leveraged ETFs, but I know a lot of uh, folks do like to trade them. I just think the timing and the strategy that when you want to use them is really important. I think you have to have patience. I think being in something, if you're if you want to be long, just be in the QQQ. 
And then if you hit key areas of support or you're making major breakouts, then you can flip some of that into the, the triple um, or the double leverage if you if that's uh, you know your desire. All right, um, let's keep moving here. So one last thing I wanted to mention, if you do look at the S&P 500, you can kind of see last month's been pretty good, right? Market's been moving up. I always like to see, okay, what's leading the market? When we're moving to the upside, what industry groups, where's money rotating to? What does Wall Street think? Wall Street's got a lot of MBAs. I mean, they're brilliant. If they're rotating into certain areas, I want to know about it. Well, one way to know about it is simply on, we have our relative strength industry group chart list that we provide for all of our annual members at Earnings Beats. And if you just pull this up in summary form, like I've done here, and you go back for one month, here's your strength. This renewable energy has been the best group. I don't have to guess. I don't have to look at 104 charts. I can look at this one summary and I can tell you that renewable energy has been the best performing group, industry group, over the course of the last month. Next up, apparel retail. Apparel retail leading. Then you got asset managers, financials. What I want to point out is if you look here from renewable energy all the way down to, this is the industrial, industrial uh, machinery, that's 24 groups. And then when I added, went through and looked at these, 19 of the 24 groups are in our five aggressive sectors. Industrials, financials, communication services, technology, and consumer discretionary. Those five sectors, 19 of the 24 top industry groups are in those five sectors. So, I mean, if you look through here and the other five, here's real estate. Here's a real estate. So you got two in the uh, defensive area. Um, what else did we have in here? Oh, here was real estate. That's the retail REITs. Um, and then you've got materials here. And you've got materials here. So you got two materials groups, three real estate groups. I know I was just talking about the sector, consumer staples doing better than consumer discretionary. But if you look over the last month, there are no consumer staples in the top, well, going down here to the XLB. This is the top 25, not one single uh, staples group. Yet, we do see a number of discretionary groups. There's gambling, XLY, DJ USCA, that's gambling. Um, home improvements, clothing and accessories, footwear, specialized consumer services, auto parts and apparel retail. A ton of the discretionary groups. So the reason that it hasn't outperformed, I don't know if you've been watching, um, the reason that the group hasn't outperformed is because it's market cap weighted. And so sometimes that aids the market. You know, if you're looking at the XLY, XLP, sometimes that aids when you've got Amazon and Tesla doing well. And when they're not doing well, it is not good. Notice. We didn't show broadline retail on here in the top 25, and we didn't show autos because we've got Amazon and Tesla, big parts of those groups. In fact, if we reverse this and look at the bottom groups, look at what's at the bottom, broadline retail and autos, Amazon, Tesla. So the high market cap, um, structure of the way the sectors are put together that can benefit the xly when tesla and amazon are doing well but you can see what happens when the two are not doing well tesla looks horrible right now absolutely horrible i love the stock long term but short term right now it's in a downtrend and it's ugly doesn't really get a whole lot uglier so uh, I personally, as a trader, I would be holding off on Tesla. We do have a little bit of support on Tesla around 165. We'll see if that holds. We're down to 167 and change at the close yesterday. Um, but 165, I mean, I don't think it's massive support. But if we did get a reversing candle there, it might be worth taking a short-term shot on it. But again, if that broke, 
I'd be back out quickly again. Anyhow, uh, Amazon and Tesla both holding back those two groups for sure. And you can see the last month, by far, they're the two worst performing groups. Okay, let's talk sentiment here for just a minute, because this was a question that was raised. Um, I had a few emails that came in, and I was saying, kind of anticipating that we were getting close to a top here on the 253-day moving average. And if we do top, if you look at these prior tops, when we top, the stock market has its biggest moves. I mean, this is indisputable. And it's because sentiment resets. And by the time you get to the peak, just about everybody that's wanted to sell has sold. And you got retail traders pouring into the puts. And at that point, that's when the market runs out of sellers and we're ready to move back to the upside. So I made the statement the other day that um, I could see this beginning to turn at any time, but certainly within the next 30 to 60 days is what I would expect. And I'm just saying that because it was a year ago that we started to see the equity only put call ratio, the daily reading started to go up in November and December of last year. And then in January really picked up. So by the time we roll into December and especially into January, any new equity only put call uh, readings, daily readings, they're going to be replacing numbers that are starting to grow. That's going to at least slow the pace of this so that we might start to see something like we saw in 2012 or even in 2009 where it just the pace started to slow and then we roll over. That's what I'm expecting. And so basically the question is, well, you know, could we go back up to these other peaks? And the answer is, of course, we could. We could do anything. I don't think we're going to, but we could. Remember, we were already much higher when we started, when we got up to this level. We, we started from much higher levels. Look at where we're starting from. If you actually just add up where we've gone from to where we are right now, we've gone up about 0.17 from about 0 0.6 or 0.46 to 0.63. Look at these other moves. From here, we were at 0.59, we went to 0.77, 0.78. We went up 0.19 during that move. Here, we went up from 0.58 to 0.69, went up 0.11. Here, we went up maybe about 14, 0 0.14, 0 0.15. This is already, we've reset. I don't care if the top is here or if it goes up to 0 0.65, 0 0.67. I don't believe it's going to go up into this range only because this was still, we were still a little fearful back from the 2009. We had all the QE, all of that was taking place. There was still a lot of negativity and fear. That all went away in 2020 and 2021. And so we're coming off a much lower level. I suspect we'll peak probably. I mean, I thought we could have peaked at 0 0.60. I wouldn't have been surprised. And we've gone be well beyond that now to 0.635. I would think maybe by 6.5, 6.75, something like that, we would be peaking. Um, but we've gotten what we've needed out of the sentiment. That's the main point. When I talked about this back in January, we were just starting to turn up. This was the biggest issue in the stock market for 2022. It wasn't rates going higher. It wasn't inflation. It was the fact that there was no fear whatsoever in the market. Complete complacency, ridiculous levels of complacency. Giddiness. Stock market's an ATM machine. That was the attitude everyone had. Just buy calls. What's the latest stock? Oh, just post it on you know, Wall Street bets. And we'll just watch it go up together. Yay. That's the way the market was. We needed change, and this is the change we've gotten. All right. I wanted to just talk scooters for just a, a minute because yesterday I saw the scooter uh, soar on Pinterest. Went up 35 points, I think, to 78 from 43. And I looked at the stock, and it was down 2.38%. And you're like, how in the heck does that work? Well, if you go over to stock charts and you look at their formula, notice that one of their long-term indicators is this 125-day rate of change, which is 30% of the weighting of the scooter. 
125 day rate of change. So on this chart, I put this 125 day rate of change down here and look at it jump yesterday. Well, wait a minute, the stock went down. What happened? Well, if you go back 125 days was this gap down. So what we were looking at the day before was this low versus, or this close versus this close back on May 23rd, which was barely up. See, we were barely above zero, but here we went down, but back then six months ago, we went, we had a huge gap down. So the 125 day, to, day rate of change actually went way up. And that's what sent the scooter score up. So it's not just what's happening today, it's what's happening six months ago that can impact the scooter. I just wanted to point that out. I thought it was very interesting. And if you're ever looking at the scooter and you see something like that, where Pinterest drops over 2%, yet its scooter went crazy. I mean, if you look at the scooters, I always have mine set up on my dashboard. But right here, look at Pinterest, one of the top scooter movers. It was up 31. I think I said 35. So it went from 47 to 78. And you might think, wow, Pinterest had a great day. And then you look, no, it didn't. It went down, yet it rallied past 30% of the large cap stocks in scooter score. You got to understand how the scooter works. Wanted to mention that. Anyhow, uh, let's keep moving. Still got a lot to go through here in just a couple minutes. Um, earnings, Agilent Technologies reported yesterday, getting a nice reaction today, up 4.39%. Uh, let's see, others that reported yesterday, Zoom. Zoom, you know, I, I saw the, the headline number, their earnings beat easily. And um, I thought, oh, wow, maybe we'll get a big move up down 8% on Zoom. Apparently, they lowered guidance for the fourth quarter, but still raised guidance for the year because of their strong fourth quarter, or strong third quarter. But uh, I don't know. It just seems like every time Zoom comes out with an announcement, uh, the stock goes down. Um, let's see. Another after the bell. Now let's, yeah, let's look at Urban Outfitters. That was another one that reported after the bell, up 3.4%. Um, and then this morning, we got obviously a bunch more reporting. And uh, Medtronic reported this morning. They beat a buck 30 versus a buck 28. Market said, We don't care. We're in a downtrend. It looks like it's going to gap down to a new low. ADI, analog devices, semiconductors, up 3%. This has been a pretty strong stock here in the month of November. And it's adding to it today, trying to get back up close to its November high. Uh, but the stock looks pretty good here in the pre-market. Three earnings reports that will be coming up. I'm going to go through these very quickly um, and just uh, give you what I think, what the chart looks like as they prepare for their earnings reports. First one is Deer. They will report tomorrow morning. I think the AD line looks pretty good. Stock price looks really good. Relative strength is just okay. It's been pulling back the last month, but it was strong. Uh, overall, though, Deer relative to the S&P is good. The, the industry group strong. I would expect to see a decent report. And if it is, maybe we threaten that 440 level from back in April. VMware, next up. Uh, VMware, nice move to the upside here recently, but still AD line, not so great. Relative strength has been good, but it's in the weak software group. A lot of mixed signals here. I would just watch the 20 day to the downside. If the numbers are really good, maybe we get to 123. Um, that's where I would be looking. And the last one is HPQ. Uh, they report today after the bell. AD line starting to turn back up. Price action's been okay. Relative strength starting to move up. The group uh, down here has been losing some strength. This one's mixed. I don't know. I'd be a little careful with this one. Anyway, that's it for me. I appreciate everybody tuning in. Have a great day. Happy trading. Hey, Grayson Rose here with Stock Charts. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, consider giving it a like down below. Maybe leave us a comment. And if you're new to the channel, you can subscribe at the link up above. We're gonna bring you daily content from an incredible collection of technical analysts and financial experts.